Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, a faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. And at his appointed season, he brought his word to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. To Titus, my true son, in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. The reason I left you in Crete was that you might straighten out what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, the husband of but one wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer is entrusted with God's work, he must be blameless not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. For there are many rebellious people, mere talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced because they are ruining whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach and that for the sake of dishonest gain. Even one of their own prophets has said, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the faith and will pay no attention to Jewish, Jewish myths or to the commands of those who reject the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. They claim to know God, but by their actions, they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. This is the word of the Lord. So it might help you to keep that open, actually, in front of you if you want to grab it or turn to it if you've not yet um, opened the Bible, just to follow through, because um, we'll work a little bit through that. But I wonder what you think about that question, what do vicars do? It's funny, I went to have my hair cut the other day, and um, obviously moving to a new place and kind of people asking about, you know, why are you here, what have you moved for? In a job like mine, you inevitably end up talking about church, about vicars, about job, uh, about Jesus and things like that. But it's a strange thing, and I think lots of people don't know what vicars do. Maybe that's you. You're quite new to church, and you think, I have no idea. It's maybe one of those old-fashioned professions, like a haberdasher, and no one really does it anymore. Maybe you do think you know what a vicar does. You can think of a million and one things that you'd quite like the new vicar here to be doing, or some particular project or mission you're hoping I'll get behind. Something that you're hoping I'll take off your plate, maybe. Maybe some feel quite wary. What is this vicar going to do? What's his agenda? Who is this guy? Well, over the next three Sundays, I hope you'll join me on a bit of a holiday to Crete. This is what Crete looks like. Has anyone been there? It's a beautiful place, isn't it? It's a lovely place to go on holiday. Um, I don't actually literally mean that we're going to go on holiday to Crete, sadly. I'm sorry about that. What I mean is that we're going to be spending some time in the book of Titus. It's not a very well-known book. Paul writing to his friend and mission partner Titus, whom he's left behind on the island of Crete. But I think it's a really good one for us. Why have I chosen it? Well, a few different reasons. One is that I'm passionate about preaching through whole books of the Bible, 
from start to finish. I think it's the best way of letting God speak to us, letting him set the agenda. And Titus is kind of good because if you've got it open, you can see it's quite short. So it won't take us all that long to get from beginning to end. In the Red Church Bibles, it's just two pages. You can literally see the whole thing. Um, If you close it, you might open it again. You can do that. That's one reason. It's also, I think, really relevant to us for this whole question of what should a vicar actually do? Most of the letters in the New Testament, if you've read any of them, are written to the whole church. You know, like the letter to Galatians, to the whole church in Galatia, or the letter to Romans, to the whole church in Rome. Titus is one of a handful that is written to just one person. He's been tasked with helping establish a new church on this island. And I think as we read in, as we read it and listen in, it contains one of the clearest and simplest explanations in the Bible of what vicars are for and how healthy churches should operate. You might think, oh, well, that's great. Good for you, Robbie. Why don't you just go and read it on your own? Why are you telling us? Well, although it's written to one person, the expectation is that the whole church is listening in. If you've got your Bibles open, just have a sneak preview of the very end. Okay, this is like when you read a novel and you try and work out what happens at the very end. Turn to the very end. Chapter 3, verse 15. Paul says, grace be with you all. So though he's writing to one person, it's almost like he's got the expectation that everybody else has been sort of peering over Titus's shoulder, snooping in his mail, trying to get at what Paul is saying to him. And that's great, because the church needs to know as well. So I think it's a helpful place to start. As we get to know each other, and as St. Peter's transitions out of an interregnum. If you like, it's a bit like a job description, or a contract, or a memorandum of understanding. But it's one that I haven't dreamt up. It comes from God himself. So let's dive in. I'll read again the first few verses. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of God's elect, and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. We tend to skip over greetings if you ever read letters of the New Testament. And that's because, you know, back in those days, it was normal to start your letter with a greeting that went something like, Hi, I'm Paul, to Titus, how are you doing? And that's kind of boring. But actually, in this greeting here, it is packed full of good stuff. It's like a beautiful symphony that introduces all the themes and tunes that are going to play out as we listen through. Paul has summarized some of the most foundational truths at the heart of the Christian gospel, the good news about our Savior Jesus. And he starts like this because on his holiday to Crete, it's actually not a holiday at all, there's one thing that Titus must remember to pack. It's not the beach towels or the lonely planet guide. It's the gospel of salvation. This is priority number one. Now, I don't know if you, if you like headings or not as you kind of listen to sermons. I've got two for us. The first one is this. I think you can have it on the slide. Thanks, Kevin. God's salvation agenda. Notice a few things. What's going to come comes from God. Paul's a servant of God and an apostle. That means like an official spokesperson for God. He speaks on behalf of Jesus. It's going to be for our good for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. And that's what it's about, the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. See that up there on the screen? Now, I don't know what that phrase makes you feel. Maybe it immediately turns you off. It sounds bookish, intellectual, old-fashioned. Here's this guy, he's just spent six years in Cambridge, and he's come to St. Peter's to lecture us all to death about knowledge and truth. That sounds so boring. But in the Bible, truth is a person. And to know God is not just to know about him, but to actually have a relationship with him. Think about this. We use that word in in normal life as well, don't we? I can say that I I might start to get to know somebody in this congregation. I hope I do get to know a lot of you. What that means 
is developing a friendship, a relationship, a sense of love and care and concern for one another. If I say that I know all about you, you're 18% carbon, you have a 950 centimetre digestive tract, your central cerebral cortex weighs in at 1,300 grams and contains over 300 billion neurons, you might think, well, that might be true, but you know nothing about me. You don't know my loves and my suffering and my history and my family and the thing I do on a Monday at 10 o'clock. But if I get to know you, then that's something different, isn't it? And I wonder if you've ever thought about God like that. You may know lots of things about Jesus. You may know even lots of things about church and how it works. But do you know him in the, in the sense of having a relationship with him? So that phrase, knowledge of the truth, it describes something wonderful, something good and precious. A wonderfully true story about a relationship with the God of the universe. Because look on verse 2. Notice the beginning and the end. It's a story that began in the mind of God before the very beginning of time. He knew before creation that you'd be here today listening to him speak. And we know how it ends too. The hope of eternal life. It's talking about our hope as Christians of a world that never ends, of a place where God will have gotten rid of suffering and sin forever, where he'll wipe every tear from our eyes, where we'll live forever with him. We live in the middle. Look at verse 3. At this appointed season, he brought his word to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God. Now is the time to hear what God says and to tell of it to others. But I love the little phrase that comes up two times. Did you spot it? End of, chapter, end of verse 3 and also end of verse 4. Our Savior. So simple and beautiful. But in those two words, you have the very heart of the Christian story. It's a story about us, how by nature we turn away from the God who made us. We're lost and in desperate need constantly veering from him like a sort of supermarket trolley that's got a bent wheel and it's a story about God how he loves us even though we don't deserve it about how Christ Jesus came into the world to rescue wonky people like us as Paul will say later on in the letter he saved us not because of righteous things we'd done but because of his mercy, because of his love. Two simple words, our savior. But we will spend the rest of eternity plumbing their depths and getting to know the person they speak of. So it's about the knowledge of the truth. And that truth, though, doesn't just stay there. It leads to godliness. First one again, the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. And again, you might squirm at that word, godliness. It feels a bit sort of old-fashioned, not that fun. Um, a few years ago, my wife Evie bought a, a shampoo thing. I think you can, I've got the picture of it that's coming up next. Um, and on the side, on the label, I think it came from Tesco's or something, it said, godliness is essential. Oh, sorry, cleanliness is essential when godliness is improbable. Do you see the sort of cultural assumptions underneath that bit of marketing? <laughs> if you want to have fun, godliness is not the way to go, but you do need to have nice hair. <laughs> Sounds boring, doesn't it? Or old-fashioned or restrictive. Godliness. I mean, who's into that anymore? But as I hope we'll see as we go through this letter, godliness is a beautiful idea. It describes the good life. Life as it was meant to be lived, like a fish in the water. Something healthy, something for our flourishing and our good. It's relationship with God, but sort of lived out practically. It's looking a little bit more like Jesus every single day in the way that we act. Not just on a Sunday morning, but throughout the week. In the way we live at home or in our families, or in public, or in the workplace, or in our neighborhood, or in our city. 
interacting what we buy and what we watch and where we go and how we spend our money and how we use our retirement and who we spend our time with. Shaping what we love and think and feel and dream. And notice the dynamic, the sort of direction of the arrow. It's crucial, and we'll see this actually, this little dynamic, all the way through the book of Titus, I hope. If you remember nothing else from the whole letter, try and remember this, the truth that leads to godliness. You can't have one without the other. It's like taking a car, it's like getting a car and taking the engine out and splitting up the car from its engine. A church that only focuses on truth and misses godliness, it's like the kind of hobbyist, the guy in his garage, who tinkers with the engine because he sort of loves all the details, but he never actually goes anywhere. He's stuck in the garage all day, or all year, or for the rest of his life. It might be interesting for the Bible nerds, or the retired vicars, but there's no living relationship. A church that is only godliness, though, the other, and no truth, where the focus is on let's do something, a project or actions or doing good, that church will soon run out of steam or turn bitter or self-righteous or worse, forget Jesus. There's a connection between the two. To the extent that we know Jesus, to that extent, and we see what he's done for us, we'll begin to live it out. And just imagine... A church that gets this truth leads to godliness dynamic. Imagine what it would be like to be part of a church like that. My hope and prayer as I begin at St. Peter's is that the church will change. Now what I don't mean is just because I'm new or because I'm going to rip up everything that's gone before. What I mean is that because God willing, I hope that together over the next few months and years... As we get to know Jesus better and grow in him and appreciate him more, he will change us. Because you can't encounter Jesus without being changed. Actually, it's not a new kind of change at all. I forgot to bring it up. I was going to read um, a little quote from this book. My um, my mum gave me a history of Lincoln when she knew that I was coming here. I was reading it. It's quite interesting. Um, I don't know if anyone's read this particular one. And there's one little bit, actually, that mentions St. Peter's Church. I think it's... um, a bishop who visited in the 1860s or something like that, and he's talking about all the different churches, and he describes them all in the city and how this one's got a lovely new aisle and that one looks, you know, it's been rebuilt and it looks brilliant. And then he says St. Peter's is well known for their good deeds. Isn't that a wonderful thing to be well known for in the middle of the 1860s? There's no one here who remembers that, are there, obviously? But, um, so it's not a new change. It's not a new change. It's an old change, but you know what I mean. So this is God's salvation agenda, the truth that leads to godliness, the incredible gospel of Jesus Christ, our Savior, that does not leave us unchanged. And you can see then, if we can have the next slide, Kevin, how this connects with that second thing, all the rest of the chapter. We won't spend quite so long on it, don't worry about it. Verses 5 to 16, I've called this a vicar's primary task. There's a connection between the two. Look at verse 5. The reason I left you on Crete, Paul says to Titus, was that you might straighten out what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. It's a cool word. It's, It's a very medical word, actually, to straighten out. It's the word that's used for fixing a bone once it's been broken, to make something healthy. And look, I'm not trying to draw a direct line between the church in Crete, which is full of, what was it? Liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons, and the church in Lincoln. Please don't hear me doing that. That's not the reason I've chosen Titus. But Titus' job is a bit like a bishop, if you like. He's to put elders, or literally presbyters, it's where we get our word priest from, into the church so that they might flourish. And as we read through, notice the organic connection between God's salvation agenda and a presbyter's primary task. Titus is supposed to appoint truth that leads to godliness kind of leaders. That cashes out in character. The elders he's to appoint must be a truth that leads to godliness kind of person. Something that they are, not just something that they do. Scan down the list. Just look at the list of things in verses 6 through 8. 
there anything you notice about those things as you look at them? They're all to do with what a leader should be and not so much what they should do. They're about character. According to Paul, this is the most important thing. And it makes total sense. He's saying, find leaders who, who embody this kind of truth that leads to godliness dynamic. Because they're entrusted with the very work of God. Now, I'll tell you, it's quite a daunting list, to be honest, to lay before you on my first Sunday. Verse 7, blameless. I'm not sure it's quite talking about being perfect. No one's perfect this side of Jesus' return. But it's about a pattern of following Jesus. It's about integrity and consistency. It talks about family life because the church is the family of God. And I feel the pressure here. In verse 7, there are five things that he shouldn't be. Not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. And in verse 8, there are six things that he should be. Hospitable, loving what's good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. You might think, why am I telling you this? Well, it's because I'm a very ordinary person. A sinner and a sufferer like all of us. I look down this list and feel daunted. If you joined at the licensing ceremony on Thursday evening, there was a lot of pomp and circumstance. Everyone dressed up and it was all very fancy. But a Christian leader is just one beggar showing another beggar where to find bread. I'm an ordinary sinner like all of you. And actually, interestingly, as you read down this list, there's nothing here that's particularly distinctive for Christian leaders. They're the kind of character traits that God loves in everybody, all of his people. So I'm telling you it because of that, but I'm also telling you because I'd love you to hold me accountable. If you like, this is my side of the contract, and I need your help, and I need your prayers. You probably know that the church in England, in all sorts of different denominations and networks, has been rocked recently by various leadership scandals over the last few years. And the great majority are to do with things about someone's character. I'm so sorry if that's something that you've experienced from a Christian leader in the past. The young Scottish preacher, Robert Murray McChain, said, the greatest need of my congregation is my own personal holiness. So please pray that for me. That's what he should be. Truth that leads to God in his character. Last little bit. There's also a truth that leads to godliness message. Because there is one thing that he needs to do, if you read it. Verse 9. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Just one thing. Hold on to this gospel of God's salvation. Don't swerve from God's salvation agenda. It's not my task to come up with something new or novel, but to lay open what's in here. Although I hope it will always be fresh. So that we might all be encouraged. Notice that he must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it's been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Again, there's a kind of positive and a negative. I trust that the message in this book, the good news salvation agenda of God, is for our good. It's for our building up and our encouragement. And I don't think he's here just talking about the sort of 20 minutes or so on a Sunday when I stand here. It's the whole of our task together to build one another up and encourage each other from Scripture. There's a negative bit too. Refute those who oppose it. I guess it makes sense. If X is true, then Y is not and as you read on, verse 10 onwards, there are plenty of others who don't get this right. So there's this double duty, the positive and the negative. And it's good that the whole church is listening in, because when Jesus encourages us, that's easy to say from the front. But when Jesus challenges us, it's one of the hardest things in the world to say from the front. But think of what Jesus himself is like. He welcomes all but never leaves us unchanged. He bids the sinner come and 
sin no more in the same encounter. So that's it, I think, the kind of contract, if you like, the memorandum of understanding, the job spec for a vicar from the book of Titus. And I hope it sets out, helps to set out some expectations. One friend of mine, when he started um, as, a, as a new vicar in a, in a place, he got a flip chart at the front. And he asked everyone, in the, I think it might have been a PCC meeting or it might have been a, a, a Sunday service, I'm not sure, to come up with all the things that they thought a vicar should do. And they wrote so many things on the piece of paper. And he had totaled it up and it was something like 300 hours a week. And it's like, oh, goodness me. It's not to say that all those things and projects and people and admin tasks or whatever it is are not important with, with a body. All of us get to do the task of church. It's not a one-man band. But I hope it does help set expectations for priorities. I'm looking forward to all the conversations we'll have here at St. Peter's in Eastgate and on the Carlton as well as we think about the future and going forward. I really want to hear your ideas and your burdens and your views and your concerns. But right here is a mandate from God that we cannot ignore and that I cannot ignore. It was conceived long before there was ever a Christian community in this place. It has an amazing eternal end, and it centers on Jesus Christ. So let's be all for him. I'm not free to come up with any other agenda. So will you get behind it? Will you join in? You may have noticed earlier that we skipped praying the collect of the day. That's because I think it's a brilliant collect, at least the sort of the traditional Book of Common Prayer one, is a pr brilliant collect for this Sunday. See if you notice the truth that leads to godliness dynamic as we pray it together. Should we pray together as we finish hearing from God? It's up on the screen. Excuse the old fashioned language, but I think it's good. Let's pray. O oh Lord, from whom all good things do come. Grant to us, thy humble servants, that by thy holy inspiration we may think those things that be good and by thy merciful guiding may perform the same through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.